Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another topic webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so just before we get started, I wanted to make some uh, short uh, announcements. And I seem not to be able to advance the slides. Let me uh, let me advance them for you. Are you ready, Fraser? Yeah, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, there will be a recording of this webinar, which we'll put onto YouTube. You'll be able to access the recordings from the regaku.com website at the webinars past, and also we'll put it onto our forum. Uh, this presentation will last around 45 minutes. We'll try to keep to that time. And at the end of the uh, presentation content, we'll have a, a live Q&A. Next slide, please. If you do want to participate in the Q&A, then please ask your questions using the Q&A button rather than the chat button. So the, the Q&A button uh, is what we'll be monitoring during the Q&A. So if you ask a question in chat, there's a chance we may miss, miss your question. So please do ask in the Q&A. Next slide, please. Uh, please join us on the forum if you're not a member already. Uh, as I said before, we'll be uploading the recording to the forum. And there's all the recordings from previous webinars, schools, and so on. Lots of content on there that's worth having. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I just wanted to draw your attention to our next topic webinar. Uh, you can use this QR code on the screen to get straight to the registration page. So this is uh, a webinar which will be given by the first customer of Synergy ED in Europe, which is uh, Georgie Bennett in ICIQ in Spain. Uh, so he, he's going to give us his perspective on the instrument, which I'm sure will be interesting to everyone. And that will take place on Thursday, September the 7th at 4 p.m. Central European time. So that's the same time as this webinar is taking place just now. Next slide, please. OK, so please let me introduce you to Joseph Ferrara, who you probably already know. Joe is our chief scientific officer, as well as wearing many other hats within the company and, and does a great job in all of those roles somehow. I don't know how you managed to spread yourself over so much, Joe. Joe was also recently elected to a fellow of the American Chemical Association. So congratulations on that. Joe, did I say that right? Uh, uh, American uh, Crystallographic uh, Association. Yeah, I, I said chemical. I, I apologize <laughs> for crystallographic. I saw the eyebrow raise and realized I'd misspoken. <laughs> So uh, without further ado, please take it away, Joe, and uh, we'll catch up with you at the end. Thank you, Fraser, for the kind words. Good day, everyone. Um, before I get started, I want to make a shameless plug. Um, I also agreed to be a guest editor for a special issue of Active C on MicroED. And so um, I will be doing this with several other people. Um, if you'd like to send me your manuscripts, um, uh, I'd certainly appreciate it rather than me having to go out and beg uh, folks for their manuscripts. So let me go ahead and get started. Thank you, Fraser. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video and um, we'll get started. So um, the title of the talk is uh, Crystal Lab Synergy ED, Single Crystal Structures from Powders. I just want to make a comment about the title. And that is, uh, if you're doing electron diffraction uh, of single crystals, uh, chances are pretty good you already have powders or you will be making powders um, because the samples need to be very small to begin with. And so here is an outline of today's talk. Um, I'm first going to talk about simultaneous XRD DSC. Um, we'll talk uh, about what that is and why it's important in this context. Then I'll talk about microelectron diffraction. Then I'm going to take a few slides to talk about acetaminophen form 3. And then uh, lastly, I'll wrap up with some other useful experiments we can do with microED. So first, what is X-ray diffraction in the context of, of uh, pharmaceuticals? What is differential scanning calorimetry? And then finally, we'll answer the question, what is simultaneous XRD DSC? So let's start off with X-ray diffraction. Um, uh, I'm sure most of you know that um, to get X-ray diffraction, one needs to satisfy Bragg's law and lambda equal 2D sine theta. This shown here in the graphic in the middle of the page. Um, I just want to uh, stress that uh, the incident X-ray can be a single photon interacting with the crystal lattice. Um, it does, you do not need to have a coherent X-ray beam um, you just need to have a, a single photon or a wavefront 
Um, you satisfy Bragg's law when the path length difference is um, equal to a wavelength or multiple wavelengths uh, as shown here in this drawing. So we can take a pharmaceutical, it could be the form of a tablet or a capsule or um, other formulation. We can expose it to x-rays if there is an ordered crystalline lattice what we'll see are lines. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with spots. Uh, it's exactly the same effect. It's just uh, the, the type of material that we're analyzing. With this uh, general purpose XRD, we can learn quite a few things about the sample. Uh, we can learn if it's amorphous. You know, if you see a halo, um, it's, it's not crystalline. If you see these nice sharp lines, that indicates that it's crystalline. From there, we can do a qualitative analysis. Do we have more than one form of the material in there, a polymorph? Then we can determine uh, percent crystallinity, how much of the material is actually crystalline versus how much is amorphous. Again, back to this halo here. We can also do quantitative analysis, and that means uh, determining what percentage of each component is in there. All these are extractable from the powder diffraction data. Now let's answer the question, what is differential scanning calorimetry? This is a, a thermal analysis technique where uh, we expose a sample to varying temperature and measure the energy flow in or out of the sample. And so uh, on the left side here, we have a, a drug compound tolbutamide. And what we're looking at as we change the temperature are phase transitions. And so uh, a dip is an endotherm, and that means energy is going into the system. A peak is an exotherm, that means energy is coming out. So an endotherm might be uh, a, a melting of the sample. An exotherm might be crystallization. Um, a glass transition might show us a small change in the baseline. Um, so this gives us information about what the sample does as we add or take away heat from the system. Now, um, we can apply both XRD and DSC individually, but it actually turns out it's, it's very uh, useful to do this simultaneous experiment. Um, and one reason is that we can uh, remove the, the correlation problem of needing uh, running the sample in a DSC and then running the sample in an XRD tool. And I have to point out that uh, we developed this attachment uh, about a decade and a half ago, but the original concept came from Tim Fawcett and his group at Dow Chemical um, in the late 80s. And in fact, this patent was uh, first published in 1989. So this idea is not new. Um, we've implemented it in a modern format that makes it uh, much more useful. So here is um, a simultaneous XRD DSC instrument. Um, we see the uh, attachment here on a smart lab. We have a rotating anode source, uh, crossbeam optics here, CBO, the attachment here, which provides both the ability to have below temperature, above room temperature, uh, humidity control, as well as uh, gas flow control. And then a Hypix 3000 detector, which allows us to collect uh, diffraction patterns very, very quickly. So here's an example. Um, on the right, we have the uh, DSC uh, pattern. So we're changing the temperature here. We then see the change in heat flow as a blue, green, red lines here. And then the change in, in diffraction pattern is shown here. So we have a, a phase here. Uh, we reach the melting point. This large endotherm is the melting point we see that the material stops diffracting um, as a, a single crystalline material and just shows an amorphous pattern. Then as we cool this material, we see that the uh, a new polymorph is formed and it's completely different than the material that we started with. And this is an important feature of this. And we have perfect correlation here. We can see the phase transition in the thermogram as well as the diffraction pattern. So now I'm gonna move on to microelectron diffraction and what it is. So microelectron diffraction allows us to break the one micron barrier. Um, just a point of fact, X-rays reach down the crystals on the order of a micron in size. Perhaps at a synchrotron, you might be able to do a crystal less than a micron, 500 nanometers or so, 
but it's a it's a very difficult experiment. Um, electrons reach up to crystals that are a micron in size. And so this goes back to my comment about uh, uh, at the beginning that most samples will be powders to begin with for electron diffraction. The methods are complementary, and together we are we can study samples that range in size from several hundred microns on an instrument like the Crystal Lab Mini down to a micron by two by three microns shown here on the FRX, which is our, our top end X-ray generator with a UG and a, a Hypix X-ray detector. Off to the far right, you can see that we can uh, look at a crystal that's on the order of 300 nanometers with electron diffraction. So what is microED? In the microED experiment, we're replacing X-rays in the single crystal diffraction experiment with electrons. We rotate the crystal continuously, just like we do in the shutterless X-ray diffraction experiment. And um, it's unlike classical zone axis electron diffraction, uh, where you line up the sample and, and you're just looking at a particular zone. This technique was developed by several groups independently in uh, 2007. It's been called MicroED, 3DED, RED, and so on. Uh, the most common terms these days are MicroED and 3DED. This technique can be applied to pharmaceuticals, natural products, proteins and peptides, uh, meta-organic frameworks, covalent organic frameworks, hydrogen-bonded organic frameworks, zeolites, minerals, and just about anything that's less than a micron in size and crystalline. Um, it has been conducted in, in uh, transmission electron microscopes adapted by a number of research groups. We decided to um, develop a system specifically for electron diffraction, and I'll mention that in the next couple of slides. So what's the difference between electrons and X-rays? So fundamentally, the electrons are scattered by the Coulomb potential. X-rays are scattered by the electron density. Um, this results in the fact that electrons have a 100,000 to a million times greater cross-section, and it means that some micron crystals are required. Uh, crystals larger than a micron will essentially stop the electron beam. It also has imp implications in the fact that we often see dynamical diffraction, uh, multiple scattering events with electrons where we would not see them with X-rays. Uh, with X-rays, we deposit much lower energy per event, uh, with the implication that we have much less damage. So electron diffraction experiments take seconds to a minute or two. X-ray experiments may take a minute to several tens of minutes. So um, the Synergy ED is a tool that we developed for doing microED in the home lab. It's compri comprised of a JOL GEM 2300 ED 200 kV gun column uh, system optimized for electron diffraction. Uh, remember these crystals are less than a wavelength of light, so we have to use the electron optics to visualize them. Um, the system also has a, a, a virtual and selectable crystal detector distance. And that, that's important for looking at long unit cells. And, and the, towards the very end of the presentation, we'll look at how that is useful. The detector is a Rogaku Hypix ED, single electron sensitive, zero background, um, continuous collection hybrid pixel detector, uh, critical for measuring uh, very the very weak signal that we see in such a system. It's driven by Chrysalis Pro. Um, we took the model for the X-ray experiment to uh, the electron experiment, and we wanted to be able to have an X-ray crystallographer walk up to the instrument with the minimum amount of training on sample handling and be able to collect, process, uh, and solve structures right away. Um, the system has a sample stage uh, providing XYZ sample alignment and a rotation uh, axis as well. In the uh, electron microscopy field, this is often called a till stage. Uh, we also provide cryo options, which you'll see are, can be very important for certain types of samples. So just very briefly, uh, one uh, finds a crystallite in a grain on the microED grid, pushes a button, 
uh, to go to diffraction mode, determines if it's a diffraction quality sample, finds the eucentric point, collects the diffraction data, and then Chrysalis Pro and AutoChem will uh, solve the structure using uh, various tools, including, including Shell XT, uh, Olex.solve, Olex2.refine, and Shell XL. So um, we've talked about uh, simultaneous XRDDSC, uh, microelectron diffraction, and now I'm going to give you a very specific example of acetaminophen. And so this was done uh, first using XRDDSC on a measurement and then uh, getting the structure by microED. So it turns out there are nine polymorphs, at, at least nine known polymorphs of acetaminophen. Um, this is described in the Schuchtenberg paper uh, from 2019. Um, form one and two are the known were the known forms by single crystal structure analysis. Um, form one is the most stable. It's it's uh, what you get in the pillar capsule that you buy from the pharmacy. Um, turns out that form two and PBCA is, has better compressive properties then form one and it melts at 159C. Um, form three was known uh, for decades in space group PCA21. It was solved in 2009 using powder diffraction data and computed structure prediction methods. Um, form seven was uh, solved by the same sorts of methods in 2019 in this paper I mentioned, which space group, uh, 2000 uh, um, space group PNA 2 sub 139, if I remember correctly. So moving on, um, acetaminophen was uh, form one was placed in a crucible in the XRD DSC sample chamber. We measured the two theta range from three to 30 degrees. Um, each exposure diffraction diffractogram was taken over 30 seconds. Uh, we measured the temperature from minus 20 to 190 degrees C. We used an atmosphere of nitrogen to preserve the sample. So uh, you can see the starting point here. This, the red line is the temperature as we move through this two hour experiment. Um, X axis here is time, Y axis is temperature. So at 170 degrees C here, we see that endotherm, the melting of the sample. Um, we have then the amorphous stage. We see some small changes. As we drop the temperature, we get a crystallization. We raise the temperature and we get another uh, re-melting uh, of the sample. So what we see in the diffraction patterns is shown here. At 25, we have form one. At 170 C, we see the melting and the formation of the amorphous pattern. Um, we see crystallization of form two and form three at 76 degrees C. Here we see a melting at 162. Now the implication there is that we may have more than one form sitting there in the uh, crucible. Um, at 115 C, we also see the transition from form three back to form two. And for, as I mentioned, the melting at, at uh, 162. So what the XRD DSC simultaneous experiment allows us to do is to see specific pharmaceutical compounds undergoing transformations very quickly and measured with a fast 2D detector. So I mentioned the crucible. So this is an aluminum uh, sample holder, about five millimeters by five millimeters. We actually use two, um, one that's empty, one with the sample. That's where the differential and differential scanning calorimetry comes from. Um, we actually were able to solve the structure by single crystal analysis, not powder and CSP methods uh, using microED. So uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Sato-san did the, uh, I'm sorry, Yamamoto-san did the original um, uh, XRD DSC experiment. Ido san then took uh, some of the sample, deposited on a micro ED grid, put it in the Synergy ED, found a few grains, and solved the structure by doing uh, a series of uh, queuing of the sample. He actually queued up 200 grains, um, wrote a Python script to analyze those grains, 
100 of those 200 grains were processed properly. And what he found was under the conditions of that uh, crucible that you saw, 56% uh, of those were actually form three, 10% um, were form one, and 34% uh, were form two. There were no other forms in that uh, analysis. So we have the structure of form one, we have the structure of form three, two, and now we have a single crystal structure of form three. And what you'll notice here is that the uh, structure doesn't look so hot. We've got um, lots of very extended thermal ellipsoids. Um, some are quite flat. Um, you know, this would raise flags for any editor of Acto. And so in order to address that, um, Sado-san, uh, repeated these experiments uh, at a macroscopic scale. And this, this slide looks like about three days worth of work. This was actually a, a few months worth of work, fine tuning the uh, temperature profile. And so what he found was he would take form one, um, heat it to 177 C, melt it, and then drop the temperature to 33 degrees C, hold that for two days, he would find that it would uh, gradually change to almost for all form three. Um, what was important here is that this is close enough to room temperature that he had plenty of time that um, to get this into synergy ED, uh, find a number of grains that were um, very well behaved and get a much better single crystal structure of uh, form three. And this has been deposited in a CSD. Um, and uh, you can see that the thermal ellipsoids here are much, much better. It's, it's two molecules in the asymmetric unit. Uh, you really can't see this very clearly, but the R1 is really quite good for uh, an electron uh, diffraction experiment. So uh, before I move on, I just wanna make sure to acknowledge Yamamoto-san who did the original XRD DSC work. Uh, Shoido, who did the original microED work uh, from the uh, crucible that we showed a few slides back, and then uh, Sato-san, who did the uh, microscopic uh, macroscopic crystallization and the resultant microED experiments. Then uh, I promised that I would look at some other useful experiments that we can conduct with microED. Um, again, these are on powders. So here's an example from my colleagues at uh, the Reese office in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, Christian Gerb, Christian Sherman, and Robert Bucher. Um, they took uh, a pill of uh, levocetirazine dihydrochloride, a, a common antihistamine, ground the pills, uh, dumped some of the material onto the grid, and uh, got a single crystal structure from this material. Um, they were also able to do the absolute structure using Chrysalis Pro and Yana 2000. And this provides a nice segue into the next discussion. Um, I mentioned very early on that one of the features of electron diffraction is that we have to deal with dynamical scattering. And that means that we have multiple scattering events and uh, this changes the intensity of the uh, resulting the fracted beam in a way that can be calculated through, uh, uh, cal through calculations, obviously, uh, but and can correct for various effects within the crystal lattice. So this is done using Crystal's ProED. We create a set of input files that can be taken in the PETs. Um, then PETs can do the dynamical refract, uh, create files for YANA 2000, and then we can do structure solution and refinement in YANA 2020. So um, what happens? Well, in absolute structure determination in electron diffraction, we actually use the dynamical diffraction effects, which breaks the equivalency of bifoot pairs and makes it possible to get absolute structures. Um, one has to do the refinement properly. In the case of uh, PETS and Yana, we're doing a block wave approximation. This has been published in the literature uh, by uh, the Palatinus group at, at the Czech Institute of Technology. So our test case has been uh, L-tyrosine um, with kinematic refinement. That is no consideration of dynamical diffraction. R1s are in the uh, low teens. Um, we use the 
kinematical refinement as a starting point. We then account for the thickness of the sample, and this reduces the R1. We then do uh, an XYZ isotropic refinement, add hydrogens, and then do the anisotropic refinement. R1 drops down to 7.6%, and we see that the gap between the enanomers is also dropped, giving us better uh, 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 satisfaction that we have, in fact, gotten the correct chirality. And so um, Clar et al. used a Z-score in order to uh, provide a metric for confidence here. And what we find is that um, for this particular sample, we have quite a high Z-score for this on the order of uh, 14, if I remember. So the way this works is we collect and uh, process the kinematical refinement data, produce a structure, produce a SIF file for Dingo and Yana 2020. Uh, we get R values and diametral intensities, and then calculate the um, intensity versus uh, IOBS for the R and S enantiomers, get a Z-score, and as I said earlier, um, a Z-score of 10 is quite good. Here is an example of clarithromycin, where the correct structure is an R1 of 13%, the incorrect structure is an R1 of 16.7, with a Z-score of 14 sigma. Um, the levocetirazine dihydrochloride gives a Z-score using scaling only of 3.8. And then uh, this natural fungicide product gives us a Z score of four with um, XYZ and ISO refinement. I should point out that these uh, refinements are very compute intensive and um, require some time to execute. So I mentioned cryotransfer early on. I wanted to make sure that I touched upon that. So here's an example of, of trehalose dihydrate which uh, inserted into the high vacuum system of the Synergy ED, loses diffraction, loses water, um, and we see the uh, anhydrous form uh, at much lower resolution. If we cryocool the sample before insertion into the Synergy ED, expose it to the vacuum at 170 K, we preserve the water in the lattice, and we get a the original structure of the dihydrate at, at, as would be seen at room temperature and room conditions, uh, providing a much better overall structure. And a second example is a hydrated fungicide here. In both cases, we get good diffraction, a good structure from both, but you can see that the, the actual structure of the material is quite different depending on whether it's hydrated or not. And in the ultimate example of a hydrated sample is a protein. And so in this case, Itosan and Yamanosan uh, took a thaumatin crystal, uh, went over to our colleagues at JOL in Akashima, put the grid in a fast ion bombardment uh, system, produced a thaumatin crystal that was only 250 nanometers thick then uh, cryotransfer that to the Synergy ED, collected data up to two angstroms. Now, if you remember, the longest unit cell of thaumatin is on the order of 150 angstroms. This required us to change the virtual crystal detector distance from our typical uh, 600 millimeters or so to 1800 millimeters. The Synergy ED actually can achieve a virtual crystal detector distance on the order of 2100 millimeters. So there's still some uh, room in there for longer unit cells. Uh, the data was collected and um, refined to a really respectable R1 of 20% with an R3 of 24%. Uh, we can see the tartrate ligand in the map, and we can even see hydrogen peaks in the map. So this, is, this demonstrates the importance of being able to run samples with cryo as well as uh, being able to change the virtual crystal detector distance to look at these very large unit cells. So a number of papers have already come out. Um, there are many more in preparation. Um, these are what's, what's open source is available through us uh, at our website. Um, and uh, we also have, as I mentioned, many more coming out. Some uh, 
few more slides and then we'll uh, go through the summary. Um, as of June 12th, we've internally solved 386 structures um, with a very wide distribution of unit cell lengths all the way from a range of 2.46 out to 152. The kinematical R1s are on the order of 17% uh, average. Um, a wide range of materials, uh, all possible Brave lattices have been looked at. Um, many, many different elements have been uh, studied uh, with the majority of materials actually being organics. And this tiny little sliver is the one protein we've done here. So in summary, um, what we were able to do is use XRD DSC to isolate uh, a particular isomorph, uh, typically a fleeting isomorph, give us information enough to capture that isomorph, I'm sorry, I said isomorph, polymorph, in a way that uh, we can use to do more uh, structural studies. We then use microED to perform single crystal analysis on grains, that is isolated material, powder material, that are much less a micron in size. And this combined technique allows us to determination of the structure of acetaminophen form three by single crystal analysis, solving a problem that was several decades in the making. Um, MicroED provides the ability to structurize crystals, uh, powders that are too small for single crystal analysis, and can provide absolute structural information. Um, this is the work of many, many people over the last uh, three plus years, um, we started with JOL in, in May of 2020 at the height of COVID. Um, all these people have been involved in this project uh, at some level or another within Rigaku, as well as JOL. And I'd like to thank everybody for all this effort. Um, lastly, um, we do provide a microED service um, you can get more information following the link uh, in the QR code shown here. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and not the chat. Thank you very much, everybody. So let's move on to the Q&A. Thank you, Joe. Um, you want to turn your camera back on? Yep. It's on now. So we have one question in the Q&A just now. I think everyone's a little shy, uh, so we'll give them some time yeah. to ask. But the um, first question so. is, I think, one of the most commonly asked for people coming from X-ray over to sure. electron detection, and that, that's why are they oh. so large? The main the, the the reason the R factors are so large is that by and large we're doing kinematic refinement, and every electron diffraction experiment has some level of dynamical effects. Uh, in the uh, experiment. When we account for dynamical defects, the R factors approach what we expect for X-rays. Um, yes, we can discuss bond lengths uh, with ED. Um, one really, uh, remember bond lengths are really based on um, the position. Uh, I've lost that question, hang on one second. Uh, position, so we can, we can discuss bond lengths. They won't be as accurate and as precise as the X-ray experiment in the kinematical approximation and the dynamical approximation, they will be much better. Um, so bond lengths are typical. Um, what we do see is that the hydrogen bond, uh, bonds involving hydrogens are a bit different because it's based on dense, uh, the, the ED bond lengths are based on uh, the polarization as opposed to the electron density. Um, so what is the largest sample size for ED? Um, the ideal thickness is somewhere between 350 and 500 nanometers. Um, for a strongly absorbing material, it will be lower. Um, the, you can have a long needle and actually probe that needle at various positions. So um, a needle that's a millimeter long is possible as long as it's not thicker than, let's say, 500 nanometers. So, uh, okay, so Christian Gerb asked the adds a comment, Crystal is Pro recently added direct, direct exports from uh, Crystal is Pro to Yana 2000 bypassing PETS2. Thank you, Christian. Um, let's see, 
how are the XRD data visually showed with the TGA DSC evaluation? Uh, basically, we get a plot that shows both um, the XRD and the uh, DSC data, as I showed early on on that picture with the smart lab. Let me go back um, all the way to towards the beginning, um, and you will see how that's shown. This is one way it's shown. So uh, let's move back. We got to go all the way to before micro ED. Oh, I'm not hitting the right. And I don't want to go too far. So while I'm doing that, let me look at. So here's an example of how the data are shown together. And there will be a timestamp uh, in the metadata with the individual data points. Um, let's see. So we've answered uh, Sasha's question. Uh, David's question, can we use ED to locate hydrogens in the structure? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we have a number of small molecule examples where we can see the, um, uh, the hydrogen uh, positions in ED data. And that very last slide I showed of Thalmatin suggested that we can see the density from the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, potential, charge potential from the hydrogen uh, cloud in the maps from Thaumatin. Um, so far, only Jana 2020 can do the dynamical refinement. Um, does anybody else out there know if somebody, if there are other refinement programs that can do this? Maybe if somebody does know, you can put it into the put chat. It, put it in the chat or um, uh, put it in the Q&A. Okay. So, uh, Sasha uh, says, you mentioned a lot of EDs like Synergy ED and some others that I cannot remember clearly on one slide. Can you please explain a bit what your meaning of them and the difference? Um, uh, can you clarify that question a little bit? I don't understand it, or maybe I, somebody else. I think maybe there's a bit of confusion about that may have been the slide um, breaking the one micron barrier where there were extra oh. extra alongside. Okay. Um, so I can go forward a little bit. <clears throat> Correct me here. if I'm wrong, Sasha and Shaka. Here. So, ah, one too far. So from here to here are X-ray devices, whereas this is the electron diffractometer. Um, how does your instrument center the crystal or do you follow the crystal with the beam during rotate rotation? We use the XYZ stage of the sample holder to find the eucentric point and then rotate around the eucentric point. So that answers Hans's question. Um, how about a proton without electron density? Uh, I don't think we can, a free floating proton uh, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't exist. It will always be attached to at least a water molecule. Um, someone else in, correct in that. In a chemical. highly polar species, then you would still be able to see diffraction because the proton will affect the electron just like the electrons do, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's you won't have a you won't have a freely pro a freely uh, floating proton, correct? In a crystal structure, I don't think so. Right. Or yeah. Well, even in solution, it's going to be attached to a water or a, 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 sure, sure. Yeah. a hydronium. Yeah. You know, it'll be either hydronium or you know uh, H3CO plus, CO2 plus, or something. It's not going to be free floating unless it's in the middle of an exchange, right? So let's see what what David says about that. Uh, okay, yes, protons have to be attached to something. Thank you, Marius. Um, uh, Christopher Cameron asks, what is the operational lifetime of the electron source and what are the replacement costs? Um, we have um, uh, been running our electron sources for a year to two years. Um, I will defer to the electron, the costs for uh, routine maintenance to your local uh, service department. Um, 
so Alan suggests, I think Sasha might have meant the slide where you have micro ED, 3D ED. Ah, okay, let me go forward. So um, the community has called this technique a number of different techniques, microelectron diffraction, three-dimensional electron diffraction, rotational electron diffraction, continuous rotational electron diffraction, electron diffraction tomography, automated diffraction tomography, single crystal electron diffraction. Um, uh, the, the, the most common names these are microelectron diffraction and 3D electron diffraction, typically micro ED in the Western hemisphere and 3D ED in the Eastern uh, hemisphere. Okay, so, or I should, uh, I misspoke. Uh, Western hemisphere, uh, the Americas versus Europe and eastward. Um, Victor asked the question, assuming you have tested multiple chiral compounds with known absolute configuration, have these, any of these failed to give the correct answer? Um, if so, what percentage? If not, which ones gave the worst comparison between absolute configurations? Um, to the best of my knowledge, we have not come up with a wrong answer yet. Um, uh, so I would say the percentage is 100 uh, in terms of the correct answer. Um, we do, uh, the worst comparisons are for kinematical refinement with uh, isotropic refinement, no hydrogens. And there, you know, it might be a percent different, half a percent difference. So one really needs to do the full refinement and do the full dynamical refinement to get the correct answer. Thank you, Victor. And uh, Robert asks, um, please speculate. Okay, considering the evolution of micro D, where does the technology and application stand in terms of placing NMR as a first step towards structure determination? NMR has become the go-to method for organic chemists. Are we still looking at a revolution in making with microED? Will the computational requirements hold microED back for now? Okay, so um, the basic uh, structures with, uh, well, let, let's take a step back. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, NMR doesn't give you absolute structure information unless you have a known uh, chiral center already built into the molecule. Um, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so uh, you won't get absolute structural information with NMR. You, you will get some basic structural information with NMR, um, but it's also very easy to get the wrong structural information with NMR. With microED, you will get the correct connectivity um, in general, um, if the sample quality is, is anywhere uh, near uh, decent enough, you will get uh, the correct atom types at the various positions. So you'll be able to distinguish between carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, fluorine easily. You will be able to find hydrogen positions. Um, for to doing absolute structure, the computational requirements uh, will require you to use dynamical diffraction to get the correct absolute structure. Um, but it's still probably better than uh, a 2D NMR experiment where you have to have a chiral center to begin with. Um, okay, uh, did that satisfactory answer your question, Robert? Okay, uh, Christopher, is there any information which suggests which chemical components are most susceptible to uh, electron radiation damage? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, some organics behave very badly. Our X-ray standard crystal cytidine um, decays extremely rapidly in the uh, X-ray beam and yet last years in the X-ray, uh, cytidine decays rapidly in the electron beam let yet lasts years in the x-ray beam. Um, tyrosine has become our go-to standard for electron diffraction because it holds up very well. Um, if you go back and look at the initial literature, acetaminophen, paracetamol was the go-to compound for everybody because it holds up so well in the electron beam at room temperature. Um, 
Uh, we do see uh, you know, other types of materials that decay relatively quickly. Um, I, I think you just have to look at each individual sample um, over, and we'll decide over time what holds up, what doesn't. Okay, so what was the largest molecular structure uh, that you successfully analyzed with electron diffraction? How did that work? Well, so far the largest has been thaumatin. Um, I don't remember the molecular weight, but it's 226 amino acids. Um, there are eight disulfides and one methionine. So it's quite large. The unit cell is, uh, if I remember, 58 by 58 by 152. So a, a good size, uh, a reasonable size protein, as a matter of fact. Um, do you have solutions for samples that can't survive the vacuum uh, from David? Yes, of course. I mentioned the cryo handling of samples. There are also sample holders that uh, can operate at room temperature with either gas or liquid uh, surrounding the sample. Um, let's see, Robert says, thank you. And Hemat asks, what will be the case in a semi-crystalline material? Um, well, if it's semi-crystalline, one can try to do electron PDF. Um, this would be a sample where you have extremely short range order, no way, low long range order to provide uh, uh, constructive interference of the electron beam. Um, there are groups looking at electron PDF and a, a paper just came out in ACTA, a Journal of Applied Crystallography on that topic um, in June. I don't have the reference. Actually, uh, maybe I do have the reference in front of me. Uh, no, I don't. Um, but just go to General Applied Crystallography and look for electron PDF. And Fraser, I guess you answered that question. So we're at uh, 46 past the hour. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, Fraser, is there anything else? Uh, could you just show the slide for the next topic webinar again, just at the end before we go? Let me. It was about four in the deck, I think. Yeah, I'm going to have to go all the way back. Uh, oh, one too many. There we go. And so um, let me just uh, do that uh, plug again for the uh, special topics issue of Acta Chris C. Um, please send me a manuscript uh, if you'd like to see it in uh, on micro, micro D, 3D electron diffraction. Um, if you'd like to see that in the uh, special issue of Act to See. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Victor, I'll forward that question to uh, Eric Reinheimer. Thank you and have a good day.